Welcome to the Dojo, the podcast where we turn marketing trends into marketing tasks that you can use to improve your marketing and generate more revenue for your business. This week, you're going to be taking three stories and turning them into tasks that you can do by the end of today, hopefully, and generate that revenue you desire. I'm Dale. I'm Jess. I'm Tim. And welcome to the Dojo. And this week, we're joined by a very special guest indeed. Uh, We're joined by Gemma (laughs) Keary. Hey, Gemma, how's it going? (laughs) Good, I'm excited to be here. Hey, everybody. I wonder if you wouldn't mind taking a few seconds just to introduce yourselves to our audience. They may not know that you're a head of account management here at Exposure Ninja. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us more. Yeah, I'm a head of account management at Exposure Ninja. I've been here for coming up to a year, um, and I have been excited to get onto the podcast and chat with you all, and I'm really excited to be here today. Fantastic. It's actually a huge win for us. I've been dying to get you on since forever, <laughs> since like a year ago, probably. So yeah, I'm actually delighted. Um, so I'm going to go around the table and ask you each for your headline for your story this week before I pick the most interesting one. I'm going to start with Tim. What's your headline for the week? I'm going to stay very on brand with some wild new AI developments that are surprising even the engineers that are working on these projects. Mm, interesting Jess let's hear your headline I have to say I already have quite a lot of opinions on Tim's AI advancements so I can imagine there's going to be a bit of a debate there Um, my story heading today is why the body shop and them going into liquidation proves that you should make a habit of revisiting your brand's positioning as what was once something that made you stand out may not still be Interesting. Do you know what? I don't know why. Maybe it's been I've been in SEO for such a long part of my marketing career. I was like, that's a very long headline. I'm going to squeeze that into my page title. I'm going to squeeze that into my video title. But no, I love that idea. I'm very uh, hot on that issue with the body shop. And Gemma, what's your headline for this week? Yeah, mine is uh, Bluey and Bunnings, a co-branding success. Interesting. Well, this house is the house of Bluey, very much so. So can't help myself. I'm going to go with, <laughs> with your story, Gemma. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so uh, if you don't know Bluey, you may have no idea what this is talking about. But Bluey is a huge, uh, I would say, worldwide phenomenon kids TV show, which I, in my opinion is the funniest kids TV show that has ever been created. And a few years back, they did an episode called Hammer Barn. Let me check I'm pronouncing that quick correctly so yeah they did an episode called hammer barn and hammer barn was actually the it's a diy store and it's based on a brand that's an australian brand called bunnings and bunnings is a diy superstore in australia kind of similar to b&q if you're in the uk um a little bit like home depot if you're in the us so uh recently so for, for the month of february Bunnings have rebranded seven of their stores and called them Hammer Barn and are giving their um, visitors the full Bluey experience based on the episode. They've um, created some merchandise. They've got Bluey characters um, in stores. And so for the whole month of March, sorry, whole month of February, people are visiting the stores to have this full Bluey experience. And then in their other stores, they also have, are still selling different Bluey merchandise in other stores. And I just think it's such a great idea that they took from that original episode that I don't think was intended for people to necessarily mm. I think anyone in, the, in Australia knows that it's Bunnings it's a household brand but it's not something that was intended originally and I think it's just a really great example of co-branding and how a success it can be you can open up to an additional market and I just love it I think it's a great idea that's fantastic I do like the idea that you can put in the parents but I have a question in regards to the kids. So, you know, this is a big thing for kids. I mean, parents love it too. I love watching Blue with my daughter. It's fantastic. It's, as you say, it's hilarious. Um, and I'm probably going to want to go there and take my kids. It's, it's for the kids to enjoy. But, it, and again, it's pulling in the parents who may never have been before. But what do you think could happen for the kids? I wonder if there's like, I, I, my mind immediately went to like Happy Meals and McDonald's. It's like you're not just providing something, you're hooking people in or hooking kids into the McDonald's experience for the rest of their life. Yeah, so one of the things from the episode, the, in the episode when um, Bluey and Bingo visit Hammer Barn, uh, their dad's actually um, uh, wants to buy a pizza oven. So I think that one of the things that they're doing is that you can get a slice of pizza there. The other thing is that 
when they go, you know, if you go into like B&Q and there's that wall of um, colours, like where you can take the sample colours for. So um, they take those in the, uh, in the episode and lots of kids have got these colours and they're using them to like decorate their room. So it's like this great opportunity for kids to like be creative and choose things for themselves. And the other thing that they're doing, which is quite interesting, is in the episode, they also um, each get a garden gnome that they call their husbands. <laughs> so they have a garden gnome husband. And, they get, and again, I think it's a great opportunity where they're now selling like bluey type gnomes that are really popular. So kids can go in and go find their own bluey gnome. And I think it's like they're this interactive space where kids can be like creative in what might just be essentially a boring DIY style. Oh, I love that. Tim, have you uh, been taking your kids anywhere like similar? Have you found yourself pulled towards any businesses or brands because of your kids' enjoyment of them? Not really. Luke is sort of a, a vessel for me to live out my own dreams, really. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh no, we and we we don't we don't have much. Um, we don't. Uh, to be honest, Bluey is just completely passed us by. Um, I'm blown away by this. This is one of those collabs that you just think, how did this even come about? Like the senior leadership in uh, Hammer Barn slash Bunnings. Like, how did they? Oh, it just blows my mind, you know, when it can be so difficult to get clients to sign off on a piece of writing for their website. How does something like this come together? I just, I'm in awe of the marketing agencies that have facilitated this for the amount of discussion that must have gone on. It's just great, really entertaining. So something that happened, so after the um, that initial episode was dropped, because it was so similar to Bunnings, people jokingly in Australia started referring to Bun Bunnings as Hammer Barn. So parents were already calling it Hammer Barn. So it's become this kind of like running joke of that actually this is the name of the brand. So instead of being like, it could have gone a different way. They're like, oh, we're not going to interact with that. They've really took it and run with it and been like, this is actually a great idea and a great opportunity and taken what was has happened quite naturally and then have been like, okay, how can we actually get the most out of this? Um, and that's this February month long experience. It kind of reminds me of uh, the IKEA experience. So I, I my, my family will sometimes go to IKEA. My daughter absolutely loves it. She runs around the kids area, and once we're in the kitchen area trying to find something that we're looking for for our kitchen, she's desperately trying to pull us back to the kids area and to play with the stuff that's out and open to pick up all the cuddly toys and stuff like that. And I think that you know the kids' experience impacts the family's experience, and then that kid just wants to go repeatedly in the future you're kind of establishing that brand connection early and just like you and i have often talked about the ikea effect and like the kind of stuff that they do and the items that pull people in people in through different age groups uh, perhaps you can expand a bit more about some of the, you know maybe some of the plushes and stuff like that are still pulling people in yeah, I was going to say, I feel like, um, I nearly called it Hammer Barn then, the Bunnings have sort of seen an online phenomenon and really pushed into it. So for example, with Ikea, they have this shark plush, it's massive, I have one, it's like really huge. And they definitely pushed into that as well as the bear they have, whose name I can never say. Um, they understood that people online and on TikTok were really enjoying these products so they include them in more advertising. They did a mini version of the bear. They did a mini version of the shark for people who maybe wouldn't want it anymore. I remember, or wouldn't want a big one, sorry. I remember they actually got rid of the sharks for a while or there was like a shortage. And I think there was a map. There was people built an online map and coded a map that you could see where you could get the shark from. Um, so people like really, really take it seriously. And I think it just shows really really great brand listening in terms of understanding what your customers are coming for or what they're interested in and what might make their experience with you more fun uh, but then obviously ikea has the benefit of that they kind of lead you through all this other beautiful stuff before you get to your shark or your other item it's the same with the, their meatballs right the meatballs at ikea are such a big hype thing but nobody, if you're going all the way to Ikea, you're not really just going there for meatballs. You're going to have a look around. So I think they've really created this. Yeah, I know, I know. But it depends how far you are from one. Like, I'm like an hour away from an Ikea. So if I go, I, it kind of needs to be, you know, for more reasons than just meatballs. But um, I think it's, like I said, it's really about that sort of brand listening and understanding 
how to move people in ikea's case and bunning's case physically move people through your store and through your funnel but perhaps there's other ways that you can kind of move people through your funnel even if it's a virtual funnel or a more business related funnel just by listening to the conversations they're having yeah and i think there was an earlier point about co-branding and doing something together there's two different audiences that might you know you get that venn diagram there's going to be those people in the middle who you can pull in and capture who might not necessarily have really known or would have gone to you and to begin with that even if you pull in a small amount it's probably worth the investment of doing that co-branding venture together to get the kind of the long-term value from the people that you pull into your you know into your store or into whatever it is that you're doing. So yeah, big proponents of co-branding uh, for sure over here at the Expression Ninja. Tim also <clears throat> made a point which I thought was really interesting about how um, thinking about all the red tape essentially of getting this over the line. And I did some research a while ago about the success of Bluey and why it has um, been so successful globally. And one of the reasons is that they took the risk in terms of they could have kept the the distribution company or the production company could have kept bluey to themselves and just distributed it all themselves but they thought actually what's better for this if we want to reach the most people yes we're going to dilute our pot a bit but we'd rather put it out to I think it's cbb's disney all these different channels um and actually what's happened is by taking that risk they've had this huge huge success like if they would have just kept it to themselves they probably would have made a fraction of the money because it wouldn't have had the global reach. So I did think that was really interesting. I think there's definitely a conversation to be had there about taking risks and understanding that sometimes you have to do these things. Yeah, absolutely. Tim, I remember when you were doing the HubSpot uh, brand analysis of maybe one year or two years ago, where you're looking at about uh, how much of the search market that they just own. I think the similarity here is like you're putting out enough content for free that you just pull people into your funnel. You're having such a wide top of funnel that people just become more aware of you. You increase that brand awareness. What and whilst they might not necessarily be after what it is you're selling right this second, they're aware of you for when they come back and they're like, actually, I do need a CRM or I need a marketing hub or whatever it is that they're, that they're uh, calling it. Mm. Yeah, I, I guess it's like, it's. It, I mean, it's really, really top of funnel, isn't it? You're getting literally kids hoping that in 18 years they have some sort of warm fuzzy <laughs> feelings about the DIY store. But, you know, kids have no buying power anyway, so it's really the parents that they're, they're targeting here. I guess it's, you know, last year we saw Barbie, didn't we? And that had they had something like 30 brand collabs. And maybe this is, you know, the next, the next phase, these brand collaborations, we're just going to see brands becoming more and more brave and, adventurous in the types of collaborations that they have i bet the team who are writing that season two episode two of bluey had no idea that like down the line they'd (laughs) they'd be collaborating with the inspiration for that show it's just wild i think what's really clever about it is that they're there's so much research done online these days people buy purchase online we're very aware of that and what they've tried to do is if you're searching for i don't know you need a plug socket and you need a new socket or something something diy related if a lot of people just pick the first thing they come to or they don't do a huge amount of research for these small products what they're doing really successfully is saying hey actually come into store here's here's an opportunity for you to bring the whole family and so all those products that may have just been online purchases to the first ad that comes up in google or whoever's top of the organic rankings they're pulling people in and um actually getting those in-store purchases so i'd be really intrigued to see what you know impact that's had on their sales and their revenue just in this this month-long period um but yeah i think it's really clever yeah super super smart i'm gonna take us on to the next story so we've got a choice between tim talking about ai and sge and all things fun like that and jesse's story about body shop i think i'm gonna pick uh tim's story so tell us a little bit more about the latest goings on ai Okay, so I think there's really three stories about AI in the last week that have been pretty huge. So most people would have seen OpenAI's new text-to-video tool, Sora. And if you haven't seen it, basically with a small amount of text prompting, this thing can produce a pretty incredible high-definition 
um, very realistic, very lifelike uh, video um, up to, I think, 60 seconds long, maybe, maybe slightly longer. Um, and it's really great. And obviously, there's loads of implications here for video uh, companies and video producers and video editors. Um, there are some incredible shots of like a sort of a drone shot over a, a, a US town during the gold mine era. And you've got to think about what it would have taken to produce that shot in the real world. They would have had to build a set. There would have been, you know, catering. There would have been logistics around building the set. You would have had teams of camera people and editors and all this actors and people, you know, just a huge amount of work. And now you can do this with a text prompt. So on one part, there's like, oh, that's that's super interesting and it's massively disruptive. And, you know, we, we don't really know the full implications of, of what this is going to mean. For me, though, the most impressive thing about Sora has been that it's got kind of um, emergent behaviors that appear to model real world um, sort of physics, really. So, you know, Pixar spent about a decade learning to model what hair looked like so they could have super realistic hair in their films. And Sora has basically learned how to do hair. And it wasn't programmed by someone. It's just ingested enough video content that it's, that it's got this sort of capability. So that's amazing. Uh, and, and that actually masked another AI announcement, which is also potentially you know, shocking, really, in some ways, which is Google's Gemini 1.5 Pro. So this is the latest generation of Google's um, Gemini uh, large language model. They haven't released it. They just released a research paper about it. But the interesting thing about Gemini 1.5 Pro is it has a super long context window. So for those who aren't total AI geeks, I think, Gemma, you might be in that category. The, the context window is the amount of information that you feed the large language model in order to get the output. So AI models and AI tools started off with fairly short context windows, maybe a few thousand tokens. So you could give it a few thousand words and it would give you an output. And then some companies started really pushing the boundaries. I think Claude had a 128,000 token context window, which basically meant you could feed Claude an entire book. It could read the book. And then, uh, and then answer your questions about it. Gemini 1.5 Pro, um, they wanted to really push this and they got it up to 10 million token context window, which means you could not only feed it one book, you could feed it an entire corpus of books. You could feed it huge amounts of information. And this really sort of transforms the capability of the model because say you wanted to have a chat bot that you could use for customer service. Well, in every every interaction with a user, potentially, you could have the chat bot sort of scrub through the entire history of all previous chats so it can have a lot more information, a lot more data to work from. That's sort of part of it. But I think the other part of it was that actually the researchers were surprised by the capabilities that Gemini 1.5 Pro had, in particular that it got actually more accurate the more data you fed it, which is the opposite behavior to what we're observing with other AIs. And that for me is the story of the week. It's that the, the researchers and the engineers working on this project are publicly expressing surprise at their capabilities. And I think that has all sorts of implications for humanity, of course, because we are we are building tools and we're playing with tools that we don't know what they can do. And when they're more capable than we realize, we go, oh, that's interesting. Let's, you know, release it or let's continue testing it. So I, th I, I yeah, for me, this is approaching the point where I'm becoming a little bit scared, I guess. And I've, uh, this is an unusual feeling for me with AI. Um, but for marketers, like the, I think the scale of the disruption that is coming and the scale of the the mess that this is going to cause to the world as we know it is is quite difficult to fathom. If we think about OpenAI Sora, the progress that AI generative AI video has made in in just a year or eleven months is is quite stunning. It's gone from totally unusable to completely usable. So if we just follow that trajectory and we continue the path that it's on. Um, the implications for all sorts of marks are, are quite amazing. Then, of course, uh, there was news that OpenAI is working on a web search product, so uh, sort of a more direct competitor to Google. Of course, we don't know what this is going to look like. Um, there's rumors that it's going to be using Bing, so there's going to be limitations in quality there. But even so, you know, the fact that OpenAI is, is going to be working on a, a search product is just massive for marketing. So I don't know what the takeaways are here other than we've just got to be ready. Like 
if we thought that AI was done with chat GPT, then geez, <laughs> it's just getting yeah. started. Yeah, it's fascinating because I thought just the other day that we we're in like growth steps that we've had a huge one with AI and there's going to be a ch kind of chill period with, you know, small little changes, uh, 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3. But then for Sora to drop this whole, this video AI where it literally looks, if you didn't know, if it was in your Instagram feed, you probably wouldn't know that it's AI generated. It's that good. It just comes along and just completely blows expectations. I think there's a use case in there um, that you kind of referenced uh, the other week in a previous uh, dojo. So if you go back and listen to the last four or five episodes, you'll be able to hear that. But there was a point about you spoke to another person who was doing uh, using AI for generating uh, ads for cars, was it? Now, one of the, like Sora's videos is a car traveling through the forest. Imagine if you could drop your client's car, if you're in manufacturing, into that space, you could generate so many ads that way. Yeah, I think one of the challenges that all of these models have is what that company had, had sort of tried to solve, which is how do I put, you know, this phone into a Sora video? At the moment, Sora is very good if you just want to say, like, create a video of someone on a phone at the top of a mountain. Yes, it can do that. But is it going to be the right person and the right phone and the right mountain? It's, it, it's, it's not so good at that. So it's good at coming up with some original concept, but continuity and, you know, let's say that you wanted to shoot a car commercial and you wanted five different shots of the car in different scenarios, that's going to be more difficult. I think that's the next challenge, but it's, you know, I think, I think we're a good chunk of the way there. And, and this is something that I think, you know, seeing the amount of resource, both money and brain power that went into generative AI in sort of late 2022 and 2023, we're now starting to see the products of that. And these yeah. challenges are so well known and so well documented that we would not want to bet on those things being solved. And for, you know, for car brands needing video creative, wow, your shoots just got a little bit cheaper. I have a, a real feeling that consumer trust is going to absolutely plummet um, when AI starts getting used more because they're not going to know. Let's say you're showing off a new skincare product and they're saying this is the before and after. Okay, great. But is it if it's AI generated? You're showing me this car in the forest, but can it go there? You know, and I actually saw on the open AI post about Sora, somebody said that, um, not made with AI is going to be the same phenomenon as no preservatives or no added sugar. You know, people are going to see that and think, wow, okay, that's, I know this is trustworthy. Now, do I think there's some industries who might benefit from this? Yes. Things like perfume ads are already off the wall because you're trying to sell a scent. Awesome. Great place to use something like this. But I mean, I'm still conflicted on it anyway, in terms of an ethical point of view. But I do think that there's going to be a real thing of people second guessing. They won't just buy stuff from an advert. People who originally would have made an impulse purchase because they saw something that showed great results are now going to be going not only on the website for reviews, but they're going to be going to places like Reddit to say, I saw this advert. Is this legit? I'm already seeing it on like some home decorating subreddits where people are saying, I found this picture. I want to recreate this. Can I? People are going, absolutely not. Or like they're saying, where can I buy this? And people are saying, you can't because it's AI. Um, so I do think there's going to be, if you're going to use AI in your advertising, you really need to tread carefully and think about if it's going to mess with your consumer trust and actually if it will save you time and money in the long run to do things traditionally. Because I think that that could potentially be a better way forward for you. Um, and also just as an FYI as well, if you pay attention to any businesses who include AI in their content, audiences take it very, very poorly. So you're going to have to be very clever about the way you do it. I think I might've mentioned this on a previous podcast, but a dress company called Selkie who sell very, very expensive dresses generated a load of their patterns using AI. And the sentiment in the comments was very, very poor to the point they had to start turning comments off because every post was people saying, you're charging me 600 pounds for a dress that you haven't even put the time in to create the designs for. What am I paying for? So you really need to sort of understand your audience, test the waters a bit and 
just make sure the sentiment is right because this technology is very interesting but it's also very scary and could send your company to the ground if you tread wrong yeah i I think that's a great point and i i completely agree that it's like how does humanity respond to this there was a I, i think we either immediately as a society learn to not trust what we see by default or society collapses there there was a a, a now deleted tweet from one of open ai's team that said something along the lines of one of the reasons they're releasing sora they're releasing the demos of sora now is to um to get a societal response i think they called it and nobody really knows what that meant and then they deleted the tweet but this is like i think a lot of people are seeing particularly with this being an election year that it would be incredibly easy to produce something which really de- deceives, you know, millions or potentially billions of people. And the implications of that are so huge, aren't they? Of course, you know, it's one thing to show you like, oh, now I've got no spots with this skincare cream and actually none of it existed in the first place. But it's quite another to say like, here's a world leader calling, you know, a particular group of people a, a terrible name in order to incite, a, you know, a war. Like this is... This is big stuff. For the first time, we can't believe what we see in a video, which is really um, it's quite profound, I think. Yeah. I saw somebody say, what about one day you've been dragged to court and you are forced to watch a video as evidence of you committing a crime that you didn't commit? And I was like, oh, don't like that. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a fear. I think there's a fear with um, AI. And I think that's what I know, certainly from um, speaking to friends who are, completely not in the market and industry and just just your average consumer and they're like well how do i know that that's real how do i know that that what they're saying and people are starting to do more research to find out if something is true and the more i think if brands need to learn to be open with their use of ai and like you say position it in the right way if you're being if you're using ai in any way i think you need to be open about it you need to say what your use is of AI is on why you're using AI, what's the benefits to the brand, but also what's the benefits to the consumer and you using AI. And I think if you can position it right and you can get it right, then it can be really beneficial. But if you get it wrong, as Jess was saying, I completely agree with everything you said. If you get it wrong, it could have such a huge impact on your brand. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the businesses that has been uh, working on the positioning between AI and having an expert human involved is Exposure Ninja. We've been you know, showing people that you can only really get the best out of AI by pairing the two together. So when we we're creating content, you take an expert, an expert writer, and pair it with AI as an assistant to have that content created. And if you're wondering how you can use AI or get the best out of your marketing, you should go to ExposureNinja.com forward slash review, request a free marketing website review. We'll have a look over and see what kind of opportunities we can find for your website. Ping that over to you as a video and outline exactly what you should do to get the very best in your traffic leads revenue for your business. I do, before we move on to the next story, want to just pick up on one item in Tim's story, which is about open AI developing a search engine. This is kind of an open question for all three of you. Do you think there's room for another search engine, especially when open AI and Bing have already had something in operation? Do we need another one? What do you think? I don't mind going first. I do. I do. Um, I saw a great LinkedIn post before we came on that, that said something along the lines of the trouble with anything that Microsoft is involved in is that they're just going to try and use this as an opportunity to get people to use their Edge browser, so they're going to screw it up. But if they can get over themselves and avoid that, I do think that there is an opportunity for another search engine because I think ChatGPT, there are a whole bunch of searches where it's much easier to go to ChatGPT to ask some custom bespoke question that might not be answered by existing content and i think it's that type of thing where you want a more custom bespoke individualized recommendation or suggestion based on a bunch of criteria that aren't commonly you know known or aren't going to be addressed where actually it would be really great to say you know i've got slightly wide feet i like these types of shoes I like these colors, I like these brands. Can you show me some stuff which fits with this? And I don't think that there's anything really like that at the moment. We have to go through a lot of hunting to find the right thing. And I think if someone can figure that out, it's probably not just gonna deliver you one pair of shoes 
as, as a response there. It's gonna, but it's going to give you a, a smaller number of things to hunt through than you might have to troll through on, you know, on Google or you're looking at multiple websites. I think any, any search where you basically have to go through, say, more than three websites to find the right thing for you, I think that's an opportunity and a demonstration that there's some inefficiency built into the current system, personally. Gemma, do you see yourself using a new open AI search if it becomes a thing? I was going to answer no, but interestingly, Tim made a good, good point that made me think. So, for example, if I'm searching for clothing, there's a couple of brands that I really like, but I'm the only maybe one or two. And sometimes the way I go about my research is go onto their websites and then see what I get retargeted on Instagram, what are, what are similar. And that's how I, I do a lot of brand research, because if you do, oh, you know, brands similar to on Google, like Tim was saying, it's really hard to actually find what you're looking for. If there was a search engine that can do that research for you and pull more specific, more like niche like answers then I probably would in those types of examples. But I think it has to have, it has to really differentiate, differentiate itself from existing search engines because otherwise it will, yeah, very quickly just be eaten up by Google. Yeah. That, that's the problem I foresee with it is that people already have the, the, the search engines that they go to. It's hard to break. It's been done. You know, Google came along and smashed up AOL and Yahoo and everyone else. Uh, but it wasn't like an overnight thing. You have to change people's habits or give but more than anything, provide them with something that's better. And because chat AI, generative AI has been seeped into so many different places at this point, it's good. A lot of the time you don't need to necessarily go to another uh, web page or browser or something else to get what you need. For example, like I'm, it's becoming more common where on my phone, Microsoft's Copilot is just there in in the app I use for for typing. So if I do have something I want to just quickly check, it's already in, in there. Or if I'm in Google Sheets and I'm like this formula busted, I have no idea how to fix this. It's getting to the point where I can ask Google within the sheet, how do I fix this? What's wrong with this formula? It's becoming less necessary for me to go to another browser to get what I need, unless it's a different kind of search, as we highlighted here, where you might be looking for a product or something a bit more complex. Jess, how do you feel about OpenAI search? Would you, do you see yourself using it? I think I would use it quite a lot, actually, um, because right now I've definitely felt, I've said this before in podcasts, I believe, but I've definitely felt myself making more complex searches because now I know that you can get such precise answers from things like ChatGPT or Claude, I want those same answers in my search. And I actually find myself getting a little bit frustrated when I'm like, I'm being so clear about what I want and the responses you're giving me are absolutely not what I want at all. So I think it the main thing, and I think this is sort of like what's been covered already, is making people make that change. And, may, you know, for it to be successful, you kind of have to encourage people. You have to teach them that this is a better way and that they'll get better results. And whether people want to change what they do is a whole other story. Yeah. It just, just was it last week or the week before when we recorded, they were talking about uh, circle to search on mobile phones. You can update your the phones and push that out and hope that people pick up on it. But... It's Samsung are going out there and running TV ads to tell people because you've got to teach people how to do this thing. That's a huge expensive thing to do. So are OpenAI going to make that investment into marketing to promote it on, you know, through TV ads, online ads, out of house? I, I don't know. It would cost a lot of money to do so. But before this becomes a two hour podcast, I'm going to move us on to the uh, third story, which Jess was yours about the body shop. Tell us more. Yes. So the body shop, I believe, has gone into liquidation recently. It's changed hands a few times over the past few years. It was with L'Oreal and then um, changed hands a couple of times before. I think they announced that all their products were going vegan and then they went into liquidation. And me and Dale, both as vegans, were like, this isn't related, we promise. Um, and realistically, based on the body shop's positioning, they should have been vegan a significant amount of time ago. Um but what I really noticed about this this whole situation, because you might be like, what's that got to do with marketing? But they were a real trailblazer that stood out for a long time. They were the only company that did what they did. They were really the only, it felt like anyway, the only loud company that were doing a lot of eco stuff in the mainstream. You could actually go into a shop 
and you didn't have to go into a sort of a little eco shop in your town. You could go to the body shop and get products that you would like. But then consumers as a whole, well, I'd like to say that we became more environmentally and ethically conscious. I mean, you still see people doing 600 pound Shein haul. Um, but I think as a whole, people would rather buy eco-friendly, environmentally friendly, ethical products, right? And then it sort of started becoming, I would say, the standard. And now a lot of competitors are offering pretty much the same thing for a lower price. Like you can go to Superdrug and get cruelty-free products. Um, And there's also the whole thing as well of if you're a L'Oreal owned company, are you really cruelty-free because you're owned by a company that tests animals? But anyway, another thing about sort of losing sight of positioning and maybe focusing too much on the money um but what that kind of led to is other than its legacy not much about the body shop really stood out these days i have not really heard anybody talking about it at all i went on their website and saw they have like tiktok made me buy it but it just felt really out of place and i previously have spent a lot of time on tiktok and not once have i seen a body shop product being recommended nor have i seen any of my three younger sisters saying, oh, I need to get this from the body shop. Like they're not interested in that. Um, And I think it's just a real lesson about how lots of things in marketing are just not set and forget. Like, yes, you've done fantastic keyword research and you're ranking really highly for these keywords. Great. You might not be in, you know, a month because somebody else might catch up to you. So you can't just do these things and expect them to stick. And I think that's the same thing with the body shop they really haven't done anything to kind of make them more exciting again or make them more interesting again you know make them relevant and so it doesn't really surprise me they also did other things like doing like multi-level marketing schemes and all this kind of stuff that just really doesn't necessarily fit with their ethical branding and i think they just really got very lost in my opinion And I'd love to know if anybody else has any thoughts on this, because this might just be my opinion based on what I've looked at online. And, you know, Dale, I saw you make a couple of faces during this conversation, sort of when I (laughs) hit on some points. So I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on their positioning or whether what what my assumptions are are correct. No, I was actually just thinking about another brand and how you can alienate your audience by the, the company changing hands. So for example... Oakley a couple of years ago was bought by a huge conglomerate just buys companies called Blackstone, Blackstone Inc. or something like that. And they just go around and buy companies. And that turned a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of people off, like huge amounts of the audience away from the product. And they navigate to others like minor figures and what have you. I do recall when the body shop was sold to L'Oreal mid 2000s, I would guess, or 2010s people were kind of like really put off by that. And I don't know if they've lost some of their brand affection from people and people have never really come back, even though I know that the body shop has done great things in terms of they acquired, um, they became a certified B corporation, which is fantastic. That's a huge uh, positive, but, and they've you know made change of their products and, and what have you. I just don't know if they've done enough to bring those people in and on your point, have they brought on, have they done enough to bring the next generation of people in by meeting them where they're hanging out? Like, are they, I don't, I really can't say, like, are they super active on um, TikTok or Instagram or anywhere else? Are there other brands that are filling that gap instead? We've got influencer led brands that we've talked about in the past as well. They're filling that gap too. There's Lush, which, you know, they fill a, they, they have a big corner of the market in terms of good ethics and things like that. Like, I don't know where the, the body shop really fits into that anymore. And perhaps that's part of the problem. Interesting um, points, because I am actually a body shop consumer, have been for, I, I have um, got a face cream from them since I was like 16 or 17, and it worked and I've never changed. But interestingly, I've never bought anything else from there. So I would have been a great, you know, great opportunity to buy additional products. I've never, I just stuck with one product. And I think part of that is that there's no there no market in like I've been on their email list. I don't remember the last time I had an email just because I had a loyalty loyalty card. So I'm not convinced that they have kept up. And like like Jess described them, they were a trailblazer in the 80s and 90s, and it's almost like they were a trailblazer. They were so far ahead of the game. Uh, it almost feels like they just kind of 
got a little bit complacent. That may not be the case, but it feels a little bit like that. And there's so much more competition these days and they haven't kept up. And I think they they that's obvious. I mean, I can't remember the last time I saw an advert for the body shop. I can't remember the last time I received an email from the body shop. And I'm a you know, I am a consumer, have have been purchasing products for years. So I also think the the costs, like you were saying, Jess, they used to be one of the cheaper um, uh, consumer, um, uh, cheaper brands, and now they're not. Like you said, you can get very similar products elsewhere. So part of me was very disappointed to hear this if they were to um, totally fold. But on the other hand, I was like, yeah, well, I'm sure I could just find the same thing elsewhere. So yeah. they're not they haven't they've only kept me out of my own laziness than actually <laughs> than doing a good job at marketing. My kind of observation with it is they kind of fell into the same uh, category as like companies like Thornton's that used to be nationwide across the UK. They used to have like a big high street presence, but then became known as the, the occasion shop. Like it's just the shop you go to two or three times a year because it's Easter, because it's Christmas. It's not somewhere you go to regularly. I wonder if they've kind of be, fall into that gap of like it's the place you only go around like mother's day or some kind or christmas or some kind of occasion you buy one of the sets and and so on you go you know and what have you i wonder if that's part of the problem as well that they've just kind of fall into that yeah we go there but only when i really have to i think it's interesting that both thornton's who were sold to ferrero and body shop who went to L'Oreal, then Natura, and then Private Equity, have both had, you know, passionate founders who, I guess, the positioning, that they set the positioning, they set the vision for the company. Then these companies get sold to larger companies for which they're just one division. And that sort of positioning, that, and I think any of us who remember Thornton's stores would remember like a real, it was a real treat, like Thornton's was a big deal. And now it's just like, it's almost like it's just become another business unit, right, of, of a larger group. And they're just like, oh, yeah, we're just, you know, this is basically IP that we can license. And it's much more of a commoditized, oh, we just need a name to slap at the top of this, you know, this this generic product. Um, I think for the body shop, for me, there's also a bit of like a, a what got you here won't got you get you there. Like Tesla, for example, electric cars, what's your USP? We're electric cars. All right, well, at some point, they knew that all the car companies were going to be bringing out electric cars. So what was going to keep people buying a Tesla when Volkswagen that's moved into electric cars? There had to be something more. And I think that's why, obviously, Elon's brand and the, the sort of the work and energy that they've put into all sorts of other things other than the fact that Teslas are just electric. And I'm not sure we got that with the body shop. USP, it isn't a USP forever. As soon as the USP becomes table stakes for a certain type of consumer, you need to be the next level ahead. You need to be continually pushing forward. I guess like Patagonia, I just got an ad for Patagonia who are trying to stop salmon farming in Iceland, right? This is a company that started off selling climbing hooks, but they've continually pushed ahead with their 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 sort of their mission and their ethics. And whereas the body shop, it feels like this was just a, a you know, a, oh yeah, there's like an ethical slant that we can use and this IP that we're buying for one of our business units. And it felt like it became less of the brand's DNA. And once that's gone, then, you know, what have you got? You've just got a brand that some people feel somewhat familiar with. And some people like Gemma just can't be bothered to find the next product to buy. <laughs> I think there's definitely something to be said about like complacency and success. Because when you sort of started talking about Tesla, it's really interesting to me because I was a real Tesla fan. I don't like Elon, but I really like Tesla. And then it felt like they became complacent at the top. And then I was seeing, you know, people are leaving the, getting their car from the factory and halfway down the motorway, this roof's falling off or they're getting into the car and the doors are cutting them frequently because the finishing isn't being done. They're spending all this money on the car and the seals aren't done correctly, you know. And immediately I was like, well, why would I buy from this company? It's the same. I used to love, love buying from Super Dry. And I remember I bought some trainers from there. They lasted me for three years. I thought, right, I'm going to go back. They lasted me two weeks. And I was like, why would I buy from you again? And it's that kind of thing that I think if you want to cut corners, like for instance, Body Shop, when they were brought by L'Oreal, maybe L'Oreal would have, should have thought to themselves, right, maybe instead of having stores, we go into department stores or we 
have a body shop stand in Boots, for example, because I think if I was going to Boots and I wanted a bit more of a high end experience, because I always used to see body shop as a more expensive option. I would maybe go and look at that. And it's the same as Thornton's, right? Like if I'm looking for a present for someone in the supermarket, I'm more likely to go for like Thornton's or Lint or one of those chocolates that feels a little bit more fancy. So maybe they should have taken the opportunity that came with being part of a big conglomerate to use those connections to think, okay, actually our best bet is to now move into a different, into a different space and reach a different audience. The audience who aren't, coming to our store specifically to shop. I mean, this is kind of going into a much wider marketing conversation and totally focusing on positioning and digital marketing anymore. But yeah, the moral of my story is check your positioning and don't get don't get complacent. Because yeah, and I'm- I think if you're, if you're buying a smaller company, recognize what you're buying and why people buy into that. And don't just, don't screw that up. I think Coca-Cola buying Innocent is a decent example of where they've actually fundamentally kept the proposition pretty similar they haven't just you know treated this as like a mass market product and yeah you know they can get you into mcdonald's and you couldn't have done that yourself but you know fundamentally innocent is basically still the innocent that it always has been so it can work it's just it's it's difficult it's not as easy as it looks i think no that's definitely not are they someone who's failed on the transition from being a um high street store and haven't transitioned to the digital marketing space well enough yeah, that's a really fair point. Maybe it's worth us doing a bit of a deep dive at some point uh, into the body shop. Um, I just want to point out as well that whilst it may look like we're trying to kind of feast on the the remains of what is the body shop, I imagine the marketing team uh, you know has done phenomenal work. It's just that we haven't really experienced it. Perhaps we don't fall into the into the target audience into the market. But well, at least Gemma is. But <laughs> yeah. But Gemma hasn't expanded from there. So again, it's all observational. I imagine they've done great work, but it's not quite, you know, there, there may be more for us to dive into. I mean, but if, they're not, if they're not feeding Gemma's email into their Facebook out, you know, their Facebook retargeting, then come on, come on guys. Like, yeah, yeah absolutely. ExposureNinja.com forward slash review. Let's get this thing turned around. <laughs> Love that. Cool. I do want to pick a, a story to turn into tasks. The entire point of this, uh, the, the Dojo podcast series is that we get something that people can do at the end of today. Um, but the three stories are fantastic. The one about uh, AI is fantastic. We should never really, you know, take a foot off the gas with that one, that one. With the body shop, I think it's a really great story because, you know, there's that whole, you know, who moved the cheese, not changing as the market changes change you know change with what people want and you know how audience behavior changes as well but i love the plurium bunning story too because co-branding probably isn't something that enough businesses consider doing or don't consider themselves prepared to do um i'm really torn i don't know on this one which one to pick i mean if you need help blue is my winner and i have good tasks that marketing managers can take from the story in my opinion anyway so if you need help i want to make my life <laughs> okay listen tim how do you feel about uh, the blue and bunnings co-branding success right. story if jess has got tasks we're, we're here for okay, magic. all right in that case i have tasks for business owners too so oh, right. <laughs> in that case, jess what tasks can marketing managers take from this story about bluey and the bunnings for me, this was really about having your ear to the ground and listening to what your target audience are talking about. If your target audience is often families to the point that it's a cult thing in the place you're located, that families go for a day out to Bunnings and then those same people are making the connection between your brand and a different brand, that's amazing. But that doesn't need to be the listening that you necessarily take away. It's not always about collaboration. It's just about really understanding what's going on in your target audience's lives and the things that they're connecting with outside of this. And Tim may have a different business owner task, which I would definitely love to hear. But for me, it's open-mindedness and really trusting the data and the information that your marketing team is finding out from your audience. I've definitely worked in places where people have said, we need to use Twitter because I use Twitter every day. And it's like, that's nice but none of our audience is on twitter oh well i i insist that half of your marketing budget goes on twitter great okay well you're not going to get any results and then they're moaning a year later that there's no results on twitter you know or x as we shall call it from now on but yeah i I would love to know tim if you have any sort of insights as a business owner and if you think there's any different tasking that they could take on not really i think 
you, you nailed it with, you know, it's, we live in a world where it's so much easier to say no to things and say yes and to be brave and let your marketing team do wild things, whether you're like, you know, Ryanair signing off on a TikTok strategy, Duolingo signing off on a TikTok strategy or Hammerfest or whatever the, the barn thing is called saying, yes, go on, let's get some kids toys in these stores. Like the credit to the business leaders that are able to just trust their marketing teams and get out the way and say yes and trust that you'll figure out any downstream damage to this. Yeah, well, a couple of tasks, as I would say, or at least one, uh, depending on the size of your business. If you are a little bit smaller, you could just pick up the phone and start talking to some of your customers and learn more about their habits and you know how they came to find you. Or if you can, speak to a few people, you know, whichever, those you go into communities or however you find them. It depends on which industry you're in. Go and speak to people who aren't yet customers and just learn as much as you can about them. You don't need to speak to thousands. Sometimes just a couple of really solid conversations can impact your marketing for the next year, two years, three years. Super. Well, Gemma, the next bit is quick fire questions. And uh, are you ready. prepared? Yes. <laughs> Super. Okay. If you had just one hour to improve your marketing, what would you do? I would probably explore email in more detail because I think there's so much information around email marketing that I don't know and would love to know more about. So if I had a spare hour, that's where I'd deep dive. Superb idea. Email marketing is becoming quite the favorite exposure ninja at the moment. Next question then. What would you do with an infinite marketing budget? I would probably, this is probably allowed down the lines of the story that I shared, but I would like to test like some kind of weird celebrity endorsement or influencer market on some like really weird product to see exactly what the results would be. I think that'd be so interesting to see how much influence people have. I absolutely love that one. That's fantastic. It's the best one yet, I think. Next question then. Which marketing skill would you recommend the 18 year old Gemma learns first? I would have loved to have learned and done some coding. I've never done coding and I don't have it. I don't actually have a good reason as to why. I just wish it's something that I'd done. I'd love to be able to code a website, uh, not for any other reason than to say that I can do it really. But yeah, that would be the probably the first thing I'd like to do. I think I'd retain, have retained it better at 18 than I would now. Well, I think if you consider that Tim built the agency off the back of building websites for businesses, I think it's a superb skill to pick up. I, I can't code. <laughs> well, you can build websites. I can copy and paste. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the next question is, what are you most excited about in marketing right now? I would probably say I'm really interested in influencer marketing. I think it's quite controversial and I think a lot of people don't like influencer marketing or don't like the idea of it. And yet we all as humans are swayed by the opinions of others. And so I think it's easy to be like, well, oh, I don't like influencers or why would someone want to be an influencer? And I think it's, I just think it's really interesting and I'm intrigued to know where it's going to go, especially with the introduction of AI. 100%. Last question. Who should we invite to be a podcast guest next? I think we should get Sinead on. Sinead from our PPC team, PPC strategy manager. I think she's awesome and has some great ideas. So I'd love to hear her on a podcast. Me too. Absolutely. 100%. Right. Consider that a message sent. <laughs> well, thanks for so much for joining us this week. Uh, Gemma, I really appreciate it. I really loved your story as well. We're big fans of Bluey over here, as you can probably tell. Join us next week for our next Dojo podcast, where we'll be turning marketing news and business stuffs into marketing trends for you, oh, marketing tasks for you to follow uh, and get the most out of your marketing. So thanks again and uh, see you soon. Bye.